now on the left wing. Is in the way. Punched away by Walker. Here's Gemmel. James. Still not really away, and Hale's going in, and Hale scores for Derby. Now it's Bunker. Packer. Colchester still finding time to get forward again, and here's Garwood, and he scores! It all seemed over, but Garwood has earned Colchester what looks now like a replay, and the scenes are unbelievable. The crowd on their feet, the Colchester players on the floor, and Derby, who had the match won and in the back, it seemed, have been pegged back right at the death. The big hoisted clearance, but it's not gone into touch. Evans again. Robbins, Wood making a run on the right side. There he is, and it's a good ball to him from Robbins. Lockhead, beaten by Taylor, but here's McVitie, and he scored! Really looked as though the ball was moving across his face too much, and he was stretching for it, but he found the top corner, George McVitie. A well-built goal going from left to right, starting with a good pass by Robbins out to the right to Wood. The cross for Lockhead, the knockdown, and then to McVitie. So first blood to Oldham after 17 minutes. Whittle and Groves on the ball. That's a good try. Very, very well hit indeed by Murray Swettle. Four boys. Robbins. Nicely weighted ball for Blair. Garwood in the middle. The goalkeeper's lost it. There's Garwood. And that's number two. Real tragedy for Jim Eadie. Delight for the man who got a hat trick yesterday, Colin Garwood. It's a beautifully weighted ball out to Blair, and Blair's cross really ought to have been taken by Jim Eady, as I'm sure he will know. And Garwood recovering on the turn to poke it in. Okay, 35 minutes gone, and Oldham Athletic, two goals to the goals. And remember, they started this match three points behind with three games in hand. Keith Hicks, a local boy, He's done well for his team this afternoon. They're all diving at it, comes to Stevens, wouldn't come down quickly enough. Way by Bailey. Stevens again. Corner. And certainly making for excitement at Eastville Stadium. I suspect that this is nothing to what we might see if Rovers did get one. Oldham still controlling the game. They may be under pressure of effort, if not always of skill, but they're still looking the better side. Bannister, yes! Bruce Bannister. And they don't deserve it. Some of the crowd who started to go away have started to come back again. From the set piece, Oldham not picking up Bannister. And he pulls one back. 76 minutes of the match gone. 2-1 the score. And we're in for a very, very hectic. 
Celtic final 14 minutes. Downing. Two full. Let's welcome the winner from the fourth division. He's from Aldershot. He scored 27 goals, Colin Garwood. Don't drop it. Colchester still finding time to get forward again. And here's Garwood! And he scored! Oh, what a finish! In the third division, the scorer of a goal that, uh, as I've already mentioned, didn't quite qualify for the top 10 BBC goals, but might well have won a competition on another channel. 22 goals in the third division, Derry Curry. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank Great you. Curran. This time it's Cutbush at his back. And Sabella. Oh, he's got away from them. And now for the, from the second division, a very, very exciting prospect into the world of football, and I can testify that from a look just a short time ago, Clive Allen with 28 goals. Great start, well done, Wallace, Allen to his left, boy can go alone, here is Allen. And from the first division in Southampton, one of those players, not in the team at the moment, which shows their uh, outstanding strength, but last year he was in the team in some fashion, uh, a goal scorer extraordinary, with 23 goals, Phil Boyle. Thank you. Okay, you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Tremendous. Thank you. Charlie George, what a glorious ball that was to Hebbard. Good cross to Boyle. It's goals which do most to lift crowds, but how to control the hooligans provided the main talking point at Thursday's goal feast. Fresh in the mind were the tragic events of last Saturday and the subsequent query by the Home Secretary, William Whitelaw, as to whether footballers were aware of their responsibilities. An answer first from Terry Curran, whose sending off preceded the riot at Oldham. Well, um, surely we are conscious. I mean, we don't really go out to cause trouble, but in the heat of the moment, things happen. And um, any human being will react to a thing what's gone against them. But when people turn around and say things like, you know, footballers are not uh, interested in what happens to the crowd, well, it's, it's nonsense, because we get frightened as well as the ordinary spectator. I get annoyed, immensely annoyed, when, uh, when in fact a player has, has been brought down, is injured, or is tackled and, and is brought down, and then goes up in the air, picks his arms up in the air to show his descent against the referee and all that sort of thing. And I think that he should be able to control himself. And I'm not seeing this. Players are aware of the responsibilities and I believe referees should be made aware as well of the bad manner in which they control the game, how they can affect the crowd and affect the players. Clubs obviously have a part to play in that responsibility by the way in which they organise the supporters. And I mean, we can go on about seating arrangements and alcohol. But there have been deaths occurring well away from football grounds. And I've been to matches where there's been crowd trouble, nothing to do with anything that's happened on the pitch, where spectators are just looking at each other and goading each other. And that's a problem for society. And I believe we need police help, and I need, we, we need the help of, uh, of William Whitelaw, the Home Secretary. His government talks about believing in law and order. And I believe there was a working committee set up under the last government with Dennis Howell. Now, I believe that's been disbanded, and I just, for the life of me, I can't see why. I personally think a majority of the problems are caused through drink. You've got to try and cut out the drink in the grounds and around the grounds and on the way to them. And one of the ways to do that is to affiliate all travelling supporters with the parent club. A club like Southampton has a, a very good travel club, and one of the main rules is that no drink at all on the day. Well, I think the, uh, the way to combat it is to have more seats in the stadiums. In fact, I'd like to see Sellers Park all seats. And uh, probably another way would be to have passports for the fans on the terraces. Just 
for the home club or across the board? Oh, right across the board, yes. I don't want to um, hit the headlines in any way, but I've always said this, and I make no excuses saying it, that if I do get a sort of crowd invasion on the field, I would have no hesitation uh, to abandon the game. This might not go with the, um, uh, with the establishment when I say that you're supposed to pick the ball up and walk off the field and, and cool things down. But um, I don't think, quite honestly, that I would do that. I would certainly come off the field and abandon the game. Now, I know that creates a problem with the police after. Uh, what are we going to do about it? It could be right. But I do believe that, uh, that games should be abandoned and not continued after a 20-minute rest or a 20-minute cooling down period. Tomney back to Wright. Wright making a bit of space for himself and telling the forwards to make a break. Hit forward by Garwood. And that's Harvey. And this could be a goal. That's a goal. A fine goal indeed. Nothing wrong with that one. One man who's threatened to put some midfield authority into Northampton's play. Going on, is he outside? Looks as if he's made a hat trick. I thought he might have been offside, but he hasn't. He's walked through there and made that a hat trick. So Eusebio is lining up to take his fourth penalty kick of the 1966 World Cup finals. And it looks like being number nine goal for Eusebio if the rest of his kicks are anything to go by. Here he is. Eusebio's ninth goal, and Portugal take the lead, 1-0 after 13 minutes of the first half. indicated he should and in exactly the position to intercept but it's kind of set his first corner and it means Richie Morgan the center half will come up so will Phil Dwyer the fullback Alston there in the goal area as Charles takes the kick and Dwyer now Morgan with a wide open Dwyer that's it it's in although Bright got it off the line Dwyer knocked it in and yeah. Anderson square of him. And couldn't reach him. Dyer. Darwin looking for a man. Finds Dyer here. Now Smith has pushed right up. Foley on the left. In comes Bobby Goff. He's done well. It's Garwood. It's there. That's a fine goal. In for Froggen, intercepted by the centre-half, Anderson. Life a little bit different for Cardiff now. Morgan playing a good game at the back. Froggen, with Lamo behind him. Dyer. Up goes Smith. And Goff. Garwood. Froggen! Oh, what a comeback! 
And just what John Frogger wanted. 